So this next section, uh, it's, a, it's a going to be around about, um, this next section explores some of the theory behind the TTA program and when working with these men and what it, what it requires to change in lifestyle behaviours. And we'll also be researching, uh, we'll also be sharing some uh, research project undertaken on the TTA program and validating some of the quantitative data with the qualitative data. And Aaron and I will sort of be co-presenting and asking questions as you go along if you like. Um, this was the topic of a research project we did on, on the program, an exploration of environment in a health education program for Māori men. One of the reasons this came about was we used to get asked a lot of questions about what's the data behind it, there's some terrific interventions and terrific this and that, so what's it coming to, is there, what's the theory behind it, are you, are you actually getting anywhere? So. We did a research project on, on just what we were doing that was what was our point of difference. What, what did we actually, if we drill it down and we talked about going to the in-depth of this program, if we drilled it down, what are some of the things? And just bear in mind some of the, your comments around the room was engagement and environment. Um, they are obviously two things that you've been highlighting throughout, uh, throughout this morning. Um, so. Yeah, like I said, initially I was I was an ICU nurse and, and I never ever thought I'd be involved in something like research, you know, that was not real nursing. I wanted to be the real nurse. But um, when I went to Kurawai, I started doing some papers and anyway, one of them was a research paper and it started generating my interest into research and thinking, actually, if we want to go after funders, if we want to look at people that are trying to make a difference, we really do have to have some sort of base as to what we're doing and to, to validate what we're doing. It's no, it's no uh, news to most of us here, mortality rates for males account for 15, just under, just under 16,000 deaths in 2016, slightly higher for females, with 3,500 of those deaths among Māori in 2016 accounting for 11% of all deaths, while Māori make up 15% of the population, and that's pretty high. Um, while in New Zealand, uh, oh sorry, in inequity is built into health systems and manifests as disparities of health, come, health outcomes between dominant and marginalised people, Starfield 2011. Within the health status of New Zealanders, there are discrepancies based on socio-economic status, eth ethnic identity and gender. And that's pretty much what we see in our practice too, is that social economic status is changing, even from five years ago. Um, I'm seeing a different type of patients coming through our clinics even from five years ago and it's all to do a lot with the social side of things that is sometimes out of their, their hands and our hands. So while New Zealand has made some gains towards health equity over the last 20 years such as improved immunisation rates for Māori, it is believed that more work needs to be done to achieve health equity, particularly for the Māori population. Māori have fewer diagnostic tests, as we know, less effective treatment plans are referred for secondary or, or tertiary procedures in significantly lower rates than non-Māori. And this also shows in the high Māori carceration rate in New Zealand as well, which I'm sure we've already heard about lots of times. Just to get to some figures about it, um, probably for me, can't see that white line, but probably these, these row rows here, when you look at the male and Māori, they're the highest figures of them all, basically. Um, it's, the, it's the usual ones, cancer, CVD, diabetes and respiratory. Although recently, um, w in our mental health credentialing, they, they seem to think that mental health is going to be overtaking CVD risk for, for uh, male mortality. So, you know, that's pretty interesting. And we're definitely noticing it in our Atane programme as, like Kevi said, there was a lot of diabetes initially, now it's becoming the mental health issues seem to be more and more prominent in, in our system and our population. So health literacy has been defined as the ability to make sound, health, healthy decisions in everyday life. It is a critical empowerment strategy to increase people's control over their health through information. Kubash, Waite and Mag, 2005. So in addition to this um, previous slide, health literacy, as we were talking about with some other people in the room, is a big end. It's nothing new to any of us here. This is where we're going to be need to be addressing and we know that by improving health literacy we're going to be improving the health outcomes. So why endeavour to do a research project? Through the TTA programme we knew that we were addressing the um, previous statistics around equity and inequality by targeting the health literacy and felt it was important to have some evidence as to what we we're trying to achieve. 
We also wanted to explore why we were getting the outcomes we were getting from the program. What was our point of difference? We felt we owed it to the healthcare and ultimately to the patients we were dealing with. So we wanted to give back and share some of the knowledge that we've already gained. And why not? And also had a lot of encouragement from my fraternity, a lot of um, people of Muller Grant and that would say, look what you guys are doing there, you should be doing some research around this. And again, I, my initial reaction was not me, no way. <laughs> um, I want to be on the walker. So, um, so, but if we, if we look at it more closely, it's, it, it, there, is a, there is a need to it for those people that need to hear it. First point of contact. The first international conference on primary health care in Alamata in September 78 identified primary health care as critical to universal health. Primary health care centres for most people are their first point of care. For men, however, there is a difference. Um, contact may be due to their wife or partner's persistence about getting checked, such as a CVRA, or as a result of injury or disease. Early interventions are not so common for men as described by Richard's experience in his CVRAs. And this is supported by the, health, uh, by the literature reviews as well, which showing men are less likely to engage in primary health care centres due to historical reasons, male image, stigma, cultural appropriateness and perhaps the old adage of old boys don't cry, big boys don't cry. So it could be said that health, primary health care centres are in a privileged position within the community and therefore hold a responsibility to engage in all levels of the population we serve. One of the things that came through in the, in the health literature was uh, in the lit review was um, the historical reasons around hospitals and health centres being set up around a predominantly female environment. And, and, and I mean that in the sense that um, a lot of us in this room, yeah, oh, I'm a minority, <laughs> but it's predominantly made up of females. Um, the la what the lit review also said was the, the language that's talked is predominantly around a female language. Um, and for some men, that's, that's a barrier to engagement. So um, just something to bear in mind about what, what some of the stigmas is around us. Not engaging as good as what we should do. And in fact, my father was uh, a typical example. He lived, he, uh, I always thought by the time he went to see his GP, things had gotten so bad down the track, um, you know, I still can't help thinking, geez, Dad, I wish you did that 10 years earlier or 15 years earlier. But he wouldn't go unless he was really sick or, you know, virtually dying before he would go in or as a result of an injury. So um, TTA is really a lot about the old ways and the new ways. The TTA program came about, as you've timely said, about the concerns about not meeting the needs of the community. And uh, some of us got together and began thinking, is there another way that we could engage? S especially with those ones that are statistically at risk. Most of the ideas have been done before. There's been... Um, when we set up the uh, when we went for this program, there was one running alongside us through the innovation funding, but his sole focus was on the gym, and he got the same amount of money going through men, but he was paid for how many people going through that gym, and his his health and well-being was all around the gym, and uh, okay, that's fine. Um, there have been other consults. Some consults have been done in Marae. There's a lot of lit review around uh, the, the greatness of uh, pharmacies going on to. Uh, into Marae and education and, and healthcare workers onto Marae's etc. Um, asthma reviews done from home so some of this has all been sort of kind of been done before um, but there's not sort of been a blend of the two that we've got today. Um, when we did this the Ministry of Health did a had Reese down who was an independent evaluator on the program and he kind of went all over the country and he was looking at different programs that the ministry was funding and even he said to us there's still nothing like this with the holistic approach that we've got that you've been hearing about today in, in New Zealand so you know we feel pretty privileged and, and, and lucky that we've, we've got something like this. And as I say, you can find references to the Ministry of Health um, wanting to blend the two together for the last 20 years, there's lots of it out there. The research objective is to explore the quant qualitative experiences of Māori men who participated in the program. <coughs> Somebody mentioned something about culture before. This was one that I, I kind of like and um, 
A culture is a way of life of a group of people, their behaviours, beliefs, values and symbols that they accept, generally without thinking about them, and that are passed along the communication and invitation from one generation to the next, culture's symbolic communication. So I guess according to uh, this definition, it's about repetitive behaviour. And if we're looking at what are we doing to um, change the behaviour of our tāne that are coming into the programme, um, this kind of looks at, yeah, what are we doing about their culture? So how do we use culture to influence change? What do we do to engage and then change habit forming habits that may have been 20 or 30 years old? And at the end of the day, it's about changing their behaviour that builds into a habit depending on the individual's needs. So whilst we talked about environment, two, two sections of environment is the, um, we'll take one guy that's on our program or previous uh, cohort, he was quite involved in gangs, that's been his environment and that outside inv thing as you go back into the gang life or the rest of it, but the environment into the TTA was his individual environment that he was building. So we can only really work on that individual environment so when they go back home or they go back into that old environment, they've got the behaviour change in them that, that, that's going to be lasting and sustainable. How do we learn? Compared to individual health education sessions, group sessions have been shown to have better outcomes in quality of life, health literacy and clinical biomarkers. And men have a long tradition of meeting in male only social hub environments. Just go to the pubs and you know, 20, 30 years ago, we were all around the pubs and the high stands and drinking and what have you. Um, Education that's delivered into a group environment is shown to have better outcomes. And also with men, tactile learning is very good as well. We, we, um, we like learning in different environments, using our hands. Um, one of the great things that we do, you, if I'm riding in the back of a van on the way to the lake or whatever, and I'm talking to one of the clients, I can have quite a good conversation, even though I don't have the eye contact with them, about what's going on with them. And that environment in the van has given me a place to sort of interact and establish some sort of therapeutic relationship that I can, as a nurse, I can actually build upon. And yeah, you know, men do learn well in groups. Um, so and to prove those and prove the statistics in the previous slides, for men's and specifically Māori men's health and wellbeing, primary health care needs an approach that engages men in their own environment. Groups are a powerful change while giving the feeling to comradeship for those individuals who struggle to make behaviour changes. Men engage with men, provide a comfortable language and when mixed with a unique blend of humour means that they can bond quickly around the shared interests of the group. There was a great lit review I was reading where they took diabetes education um, to the barber shop because a lot of the men, it was, a, it was in the uh, southern states of America, Georgia, and, and a lot of men would gather around the barber shop and they were talking, the diabetes nurse trying to get them in and get their reviews done. So she decided actually she took <laughs> necessary equipment and tools into the barber shop because you couldn't, couldn't stop them talking. So. Yeah, so you know, the lit review is backing up a little bit what we already really know, but it's actually sort of saying, yeah, it's out there, it's important, and it's, it's, it's relevant for men's and men's health. Lewin, Lewin's equation, I don't know whether some of you might have heard of him, um, I've used his, his, some of his work in the past. Kurt Lewin was uh, a chap that in 1936, he wrote a simple equation that changed the way we think about habits and behaviour. Again, something old. Basically what he's saying is behaviour is a function of the person and their environment. And Lewin was um, a product of uh, Nazi Germany in the, in the 30s and 40s and what he was noticing was the young people and the people of that stage, good people turning into bad people you might say. And he was, it was his quest as a psychologist as to find out what was going on, what's, why are these good one day and these other people changing the next. And, and he put a lot of the um, theories and, and built upon the hypotheses around environments and how powerful and influential they actually are. <coughs> he also uses um, a great analogy which we use with the men as well, um, about a block of ice. Three, our habits can be, use the analogy of a block of ice. We come in with my old habit, 
Kevy was a smoker, okay, his habit has been smoking, smoking. That habit then needs to be melted away. He needs to understand what, what the what the causes of smoking are, what the alternatives are, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. He calls that the melting stage, then the refreezing stage. The new stages of giving up um, eating chocolate or ice cream or something, whatever that stage may be. So we use, you know, blocks of ice as the way of change. And often we will um, we will actually talk about the men to a point, sometimes we use another um, formula he uses is about a goal, a goal plus a win plus emotion equals BC, behaviour change. And we really emphasise the fact that if the guys on the programme pick up something, they achieve it, they make their frittata, they feel good about it, don't diminish, diminish the, the emotional contact that you have with that because that will eventually do stuff in the old brain that wants you to repeat that behaviour and repeat it and repeat it. Because you've got to remember, a lot of our guys that have come onto the program have had knockback after knockback after knockback for various reasons. They've never, most of them never have had a chance to feel good about themselves. So you're dealing with those sort of complexities and, and uh, habits. So collaboration. Um, we have talked a lot about this. What I will say... Um, is that every cohort that we have, we actually try to identify a theme from as well, be it depression, be it an eating disorder, be it an addiction to alcohol or something. And what that does is it formulates our interventions for that cohort. So it's not so much for the individual. So while we're having our advisory hui, we actually put the men together that actually are going to collaborate well with each other. So, for example, if we had everybody on there that was severely depressed, we probably wouldn't run that cohort. We'd probably need some, because we'd get depressed, we'd run some with, well, some with depression, some probably with that, because uh, we do get people that are quite highly motivated, particularly the 65-year-old, some, some of them. And they can, they can bring up the ones that aren't so motivated. And you'd be surprised how much energy is in some of the older men that we put on there. They, yeah, do me to shame. So it's about, and then they think, oh, yeah, if he can do it, geez, we've had guys with one arms, one legs, you name it and um, so it kind of brings the cohort together and that's that formula about bringing the theory of the group together that's really um, going to bond, collaborate and join together. So most of the big things I was going to talk about today have been brushed over because these boys have been taking up all the time <laughs> but I'm sure you can uh, agree with me that's actually the most value is listening to, to their first hand experiences. So I'll talk a little about the collaboration I guess that's for me coming in from the outside, if you will, not being part of Kōrowai. So, um, if you remember the first one of the first slides when I think it was Kevi put up, we had all the different uh, people, all the other the groups, organisations that were all these different pillars. So there's nothing new there. They're all out in everybody's, um, I guess, back in your environments. Uh, all the different like cancer society, diabetes, all the other addiction services. They're out there. Everyone's got access to them. I guess the difference for us and the success is how we've been able to collaborate and integrate all of those together. And I'll use an example back from my um, rugby sporting days. So we had an injured player, and so the doctor goes and sees the person, makes a diagnosis. We've got the physio who'll be working with that player to rehab the, the certain injury. I'm the trainer coming and working with the physio on that injury, but also train the other parts of, of the, you know, the person that's not injured. You've then got the coach who might modify that person's the training load they've got as they come back and you modify their role in the game. So there's nothing kind of really groundbreaking. That's all, all those services are wrapped around that one player to make sure that player gets back out onto the field as soon as possible. So it seems pretty straightforward, right? Yet if we go look into the health model and the way most of us, and I apologise if it's generalisation, most of us work, all those services would be linked out like one straight line. So you might go see your doctor and then you go and pass it on to the physio. And so the physio has got to then ask all the questions that the doctor was asking and follow information. He then does a bit of work, passes it on to the gym person, who then has to go back and maybe talk to the physio, maybe try and talk, talk to the doctor who doesn't actually <coughs> want to talk to them because they're not a medical person. You know, so you just they get passed along the conveyor belt, and we wonder why at the end we're not getting the same outcomes. There. So what we did right at the start was we sat and says, well, how do we we change it? We can have that same model where, I guess the example is a fence, and each one of those those services is the pillar in the fence and we just pass the person along and along till they get to the end, there's no fence. You know, what's the point of that fence and is offering no protection? So what we decided was 
to go for this, this fortified par model was actually, let's put that fence around the person. So we put the person in the middle, and now all these services are not focused on what their one job is, they're focused on how they work with all the other people around them to be the benefit of that person in the middle. And, I mean, it seems pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple, but as I'm sure you're all aware, they're trying to get that to actually to happen in the real world. It's not always the easiest way. And that's coming from where I was, so I was with that, the, the rugby high performance side of it. Then about 10 years ago, I saw the light, got into the rehab side of it. And I'm really lucky where I work is that's what our model, it is a, a really holistic model actually. The client is the centre of our, of our program, so they come in and all the services are wrapped in around, around them. So whether it be OT, physio, psych, the rheumatologist, the gym. So that's where, like I said right at the start, that's how we got that natural fit with, with Kōrua and, and this program. So for us that has been the success, is that collaboration, not for what's my role and what I need to do, but actually what's my role with everyone else that is providing the service too. Uh, I worked on a small project, a survey about referrals in, um, by uh, uh, health professionals. So there was a group of us that worked on this project and we did the survey amongst uh, primary care health professionals as to why you would refer in or what's your modem of referring. And when we analysed all the data, basically it came down to trust. Um, I'm not going to refer my, my patient into this program unless I really trust that program's going to be okay for this, for, the, for this patient that I'm looking after. You know, the old do no harm adage. So I think, because um, that's the way we've been trained, you know, as health professionals generally, um, we don't want to harm our patients. We want to make sure they're safe and in a good environment. And so that's the way we think of. So a lot of effort has been building and building rapport and relationships within primary care and showcasing what we're doing so that we, our, the referrals will come in to a, to a, a bigger, bigger pot. Um, just briefly, the study design was a, a qualitative study type using a quantitative descriptive methodology. Um, which involved a recorded focus group method that was then transcribed from which we got a thematic analysis that was identified. So what does all that mean? So um, we took a focus group in week nine and uh, with specific questions relating to the experiences in the TTA. The moderator, um, it was, I think it lasted for about an hour um, and the whole, the whole stuff was transcribed and then from that we, we pulled out the themes that uh, we got from it. And the, uh, the moderator at the time expressed how moved he was by the honesty of the focus group. Um, and again, that seems to be the theme with the TTA men that we get in. Once they get into that group, that honesty is always there about themselves. Group was given, uh, the group were given Kai afterwards as an, as an appreciation for their time. Sub-themes were identified, but perhaps the predominant theme from the group was one of environment. Um, and these are just some of the comments around environment that came from the focus group. So I think, yeah, I think we've probably said enough about that, but one lasting comment was that one of the men said, no one sort of listened to me, but I mean just having someone there to listen to me has changed me. Um, in our, in our noho, we do a symbolism with the men where they have to sit down and they get some coins and they have to make a symbol. He made a symbol of a face with a mouth with, a, with his two crosses over it. And then they have to talk about the symbol. Um, and he said, oh, that's me. I'm not allowed to say anything. I'm very, oh, I'll keep it all to myself. He was a brilliant guy, but he was just, well, by the end of 10 weeks, you know, he was a, he was a trans, changed man. He was definitely talking and he's gone on to do some terrific things within the community. The second sub theme that was probably most evident was self-identity in relation to Kuwayo. Um, again, I'll just let you read some of those comments. Going back to who am I? What am I on this earth for? Where am I? One of the lasting comments I'll leave you with also with, for me it has made me reassess my life and realise the role model I am supposed to be as Tane and how I try to utilise the whakaroa of Tane Taki Tuaki to guide my life and be a better man and to represent Tane's name well. So we're restoring pride into them. They're starting to lift up. They want to do what's right. The, whilst there was considerable overlaps with themes of the environment self-identity, um, for example, the environment became important enough to encourage the men to have a voice in how they felt 
and to be heard, especially when it came to sharing their own personal stories with each other and with us. It was as if a barrier was lifted and this opened the door to challenging who they were and what they can change in their life. The key thing from the data analysis was that this learning environment provides self-identity and growth. Um, some of the recommendations, the study aimed to explore the quantitative experiences of Māori men who participated in the program. So um, this research project proposed several recommendations to health professionals working in primary health care sector. Better collaboration within community sectors using their resources to educate the higher risk populations. Um, you know, we, I was at a mental health uh, forum not so long ago and I first started nursing in mental health and if we talked to the community we'd probably have set up all of us could fit in that table. I went to this room about mental health community and, 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 and it was just about as many people here today and I thought, wow, that's a lot of, that's a lot of people. Why are our statistics so bad? You know, I often wonder maybe we do have the resources there. Are we just not collaborating? It's that old adage again. Are we not breaking down those barriers and, 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 and working? Develop a culturally appropriate community model of care within primary care, uh, primary health, sorry. Um, using items relevant to the culture you're working in, and we were hoping and we hopefully we will do, looking at like language, pictures, welcome signs, especially particularly for, for men or Third one, provide primary healthcare centres that are targeted towards male friendly environments. Perhaps the future of healthcare centres may look a little bit like a, a WAF checking station or maybe a men's health shed health kiosk where you come in, get your pipes done, your bowel, you know, the computer checked out, pipes. Who knows? Fourth recommendation, educate primary health care nurses in working collaboratively with community health workers to deliver health education in, in varied environments. And I suppose we've talked a lot about that today and the importance of it, and I just wish there was more resources from it. Just hearing from a colleague in this room, you know, I just said, man, you need a Kevin or a, or a Richard working alongside you, you know. There's just a lot more that can be done, but so be it. And uh, fifth one, further research into assessing how the study would apply in other areas would add some validation to the study and benefit other ethnicities as well. So in conclusion, two points. Consideration needs to be given by health professionals to the barriers that prevent men, and in particular Māori men, from engaging fully with traditional health care services. And traditional health care services are, are the ones that I'm talking about how we generally have established today. So what are the perceived barriers that men may have? Again, is it a, the stigma about going to the doctor? What stops them walking through the door? Perhaps if we run men's, again, uh, health more outside the traditional healthcare centres, we could have significant benefits. Outside engagements with clients are valuable. Riding in the van to, on the way to Native Kai, um, on the marae, excellent teaching opportunities and teaching moments, and build, especially around building that therapeutic relationship with us as health professionals, what we're always trying to strive for. So primary healthcare centres, if resourced appropriately, um, can have rewarding outcome for patients and also for health professionals as well. Some references and that's me and us.